Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris. Oh, shoot. I was trying to think of a good intro, and this is my intro. Hello. And botched it. I'm Jesse. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast, the premier geology podcast. Woo. How's everyone doing today? You guys doing all right? I'm feeling uh, great. Yeah. High on the hog. To semi great. <laughs> you know, all right. Not saying awesome, but, you know, fairly good. Yeah. After I, after I eat food, I feel much better. Mm. Mm. I did have a handful of cheese that's about 20 seconds ago. So I'm feeling pretty good myself. Yeah, you're good for about five minutes, and then you'll probably start. I guarantee you're not even going to realize what you're going to do in the middle of the podcast. You'll just start crunching the cheez its Never. I am a consummate <laughs> professional, my friend. <laughs> that, All right. Anyway, let's get us back on track. Back yeah. on track. We got an action-packed show today. We're going to try something new today. So this is uh, the first first installment of a two-part episode. At least two parts. At least we'll see how far we get today. Because yes. You know, we got an outline. We know where we're going with this, but you know, we yeah. have fun too, you know, and if uh, we go off on some tangents and so be it. Right. But we're talking about coal today, ladies and gentlemen, I took, I brought up my coal hat just for this episode. And uh, so how we got this set up, we're going to shoot for today. The first episode today is going to be kind of just about the kind of how does coal form kind of more like the, you know, more of the geology side of things. I guess the whole thing's geology really. But, uh, you know, how it forms and, and how we use it, uh, kind of a little bit of the history behind it, I guess. And then uh, next week, we are going to talk, do a whole episode on the environmental impacts of coal. So. Oh, now, I, before we get started, uh, why, why do you have a coal hat? And where did you oh, get a coal hat? I found it. I got it at a gas station in West Virginia. There's no <laughs> story about it. I just. <laughs> I All right. Be, I was Enough. in West Virginia. I saw it in a gas station. I was like, not only is it blaze orange, but it has camo on the uh, on the brim. Oh, I wasn't sure if the brim was just like salty, dirty. You know, uh, sometimes yeah. hats get salty. Yeah, no, that's dirty. that's that's camo. So it's just cool. <laughs> nice. it's, it's just, it was just the whole package. I was like, this is, I have to, I have to own this hat. So, that a boy. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, cool. So. Coal is, I mean, it's turned into a topic that's gotten very political over. Well, I, tell, I, I guess it really, really got political. We'll talk a little bit about that over the, the last uh, 10 years or so with uh, some of the, the coal l- l- lobbyists getting involved and stuff like that. But uh, let's let's kick things off the top before we get into the politics and, and stuff like that. I, I, I don't, the, the point of this uh, podcast is not the point of this episode is not to get into the politics of things. I'm, I, you know, we're just trying to portray well, the facts. I'm out. You're out. So. I'm out. I was, right, so was going to be- sit on my high horse and talk about all the great things about coal. But now I'm kidding. That's Thornburg. Anyways. So. <laughs> uh, so, Jesse was and- born and raised in the bosom of I- coal country. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, I don't know. I thought of the idea. I was like, you know, let's, let- I don't know why it-, it popped in my head to do an episode about coal, but it's kind of. That's definitely a ge- geology topic, and, and we definitely, I don't think we've even come close to touching this topic. We've mentioned it a couple times, maybe throughout. Yeah, we have mentioned over, it, but over the years. But, I know uh, exactly why you brought it up because you wanted to just tickle Jesse's fancy. Mm-hmm. I just kind of wanted to just, you know, yeah. wind him up and just let him go. Let's, I appreciate let's, you let's, staying on my good side. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's what we're here for. All right. So, how does coal form, Chris? Well, coal comes from. Uh, it, it, it forms from like uh, swampy environments or ba- or you can also get it forming from like uh, estuaries. Uh, any, you, what you need, number one, are, is vegetation. Coal comes from vegetation, all right? And you need this vegetation for it to die. And then the other, the trick is to get coal forming. You don't want this stuff to decompose. So that's why we get coal forming in these anoxic environments. All right. So like things like, like, let's say like a, like a swamp, for example, some think of something like the Everglades, like the bayous of Louisiana, something, something like that, where it's just yeah, where standing, the, lots of standing water, saturated ground. low energy, the water is not low really energy. Moving. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when it's, <clears throat> and the reason it's anoxic 
is because because the water is not moving or moving very slowly, any bacteria that's in there, basically it's bacteria when it decomposes or breaks something down, it uses oxygen. And so if the water is stagnant, the bacteria uses up the oxygen in that water really quickly. And so that's, you know, that's why if you have a fish tank or something, you need to put a little bubbler in or something like that. Mm-hmm. Keep that water moving because the water exchanges uh, with the atmosphere oxygen when it's moving. But yeah. if it's not moving. Bubbles, 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 bubbles. Yeah. For those of you who've watched Finding Nemo. <laughs> so <laughs> I've actually never seen Finding Nemo. I have what? nothing to add. I, no, uh, I've never seen it. Put that on the list, buddy. Yeah. That's a classic. <laughs> You guys both got kids. I'm know. pretty. I'm trying to figure out if I watched Finding Nemo before I, I had kids. One hundred percent did. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah, it's pretty good. Finding Nemo came out in 2003. Yeah. Well, my my oldest was born in 2009. So. Whew, man. Wow. Okay. All right. So back to this call thing. All right. So we're not done. <laughs> We're not we're not finished yet. All right. So all right. So no bubbles, no breakdown. Yeah. So we got this. You know, you want to you want to minimize the decomposition of your of the the vegetative matter, your plant matter material, right? So over time, uh, you know, you get more vegetative material piling up on top of that, and so this stuff becomes buried, all right? And you give it a you bury it, and then you add, uh, you know then over time you start heating it up. Right. Well, let me. Or do you want to? Oh, I'm. Sorry. I, I know where you're going to go. So go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say two things. Swamps and and estuaries are are super productive, so things grow there like crazy, mm-hmm. and and so you have the, a lot of this turnover. So the biomass just falls and piles up. But aside from just piling up and not breaking down, you also need <clears throat> low sediment input as well. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Because you can't you can't have like <clears throat> I don't know sand or, or sediment being deposited and mixing in. Yeah, something other than organic material, basically something other than carbon mixing yeah, in. You need just that car- you need that organic material, and that's it. Yeah, it, just a really really stagnant environment. Yeah. So think of like like a swamp, lots of mosquitoes flying around, and just probably smells great in the not really kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that is why estuaries and and some back bays and swamps and they they stink like that because there is that anoxic anaerobic uh process happening and it releases you know smelly gas sulfur well, you, and yeah and you smell especially like at low tide when it when the upper layers sort of start um oxidizing breaking down and you're smelling that degassing and whatnot yeah anyway Sorry to interrupt. Oh, oh. So, um, all right. So the, when now when we start forming coal, the first thing before we even get to coal, the first thing that forms is peat, right? It's this, it's this material called peat. And this, we're going through what's known as the coal rank, right? So there's, we're kind of going to get into the whole, uh, I guess you could say kind of like a spectrum. Would you consider it like a spectrum, guys? Or, or is this, I guess- yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. The spectrum of coal. I never referred to it like that, but I was just thinking about that just now. All right. So the first thing that forms is peat. All right. So peat's peat's not coal. All right. It's like uh, at this point, it's like 50% carbon. It comes from these like shallow deposits from bogs, uh, mosses, and grasses. And it forms over the order of like uh, like several thousand years or so. So peat, peat's pretty common. Um, like you can go buy it at, you know, wherever you, your local nursery or whatever it's, you can use it as a, it's a great mulch for your garden. Um, but you know, that's just, the, it's like, it's basically what peat is. It's partially decomposed organic material. Yeah. Right. And at, so it, the, the way it turns into peat is that as you pile up this organic material, it starts to compact and it starts to dewater so it dehydrates and um, it, you're basically the volatile. So gases and liquids, water in this case, or carbon dioxide come off of it. And, and they're what we call the volatiles. 
And so basically all you're concentrating are, are the, the organic material, the carbon that's left behind. Mm -hmm. So we, when we talk about coal rank, we talk about essentially how pure or, or the concentration of organic carbon there is, or carbon, I guess. Yeah. So not to keep calling it organic. No, but, but peat in and of itself, it, it, takes, it takes a bit to get it to catch fire. But you, you can get yeah. it to ignite. And you can have lower, you can have peat anywhere from 30, you could have 30% peat. And, you know, if you go to like Scotland or Ireland and, <clears throat> and you're actively forming peat in sort of the, the lowlands or the, the bogs there. I see an episode of Bear Grylls where he, uh, he purposely jumps into a peat bog and Ooh. apparently it has a rather ripe odor to it. Yeah. Sure. Well, <laughs> and this, this is sort of a, a side story. You know, <clears throat> we have multiple, and this isn't the first time we or I have brought this up on the show. You have preserved bodies in these bogs that, that all of the soft tissue is preserved. They're preserved as, you know, they might be a little squished and they look worse for wear but they're being preserved because it's an anoxic environment. So the bacteria has, can't decompose or break down the body because there's no oxygen. So it's the same idea. You know, this is why you get coal here where you get peat. Yeah. It's, old it's, uh, peat bog peat. Old peat bog peat. So, you know, put that bog body in there long enough and it will get incorporated into coal. And yeah. that's how the zombie apocalypse starts. Yep. Throw it in the furnace. <laughs> So even you can even see, um, at least in transgressive environments, uh, that's where essentially it, sea levels rising. Um, but where you get barrier island rollover, where the, uh, along the coast where the barrier islands are are moving landward, you can start to see clumps of peat start coming out of the sand. Um, and what's happening is that peat starts to form in the back bay in the estuary, initially landward of your barrier island but as the barrier island is moving landward then all of a sudden it's on top of the old peat deposits and you can actually start to see it kind of eroding out onto the uh onto the surface of the beach there and yeah if you've ever done drilling down by the beach you you almost always see like sand 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 uh what they call meadow mat which is essentially the beginnings of peat and then you get to peat and yeah huh. Pretty cool. Yeah. And it's, you know, as a stratigrapher, when I was seeing, it, I was like, this is awesome. And I was like, yeah, we're just looking for the confining layer. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, but where's the mud? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> All right. So that's Pete. Anything else about Pete before we move on? Uh, it's not no. really cool. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, and this is something we could, we'll talk about it later when we talk about how we use this as a fuel. Peat is is pretty dirty because it 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 has a lot of these volatiles still in it. Yeah, it hasn't been it has purified by nature. Yes, it's, since it it's, since it's you know less than half carbon, that means half of it is made up of other things mm -hmm. that are volatilizing and coming off when you burn it yeah mm -hmm. no bueno so as um as we continue to bury this material deeper we add more pressure and we continue to heat it up we bake it then this material we, we get the next uh the next in line that comes out is called lignite lignite is i've always kind of considered it like you're really like dirty coal. It's like, it's, it's basically the, the kind of like the first, the first stop on the, on the coal, on the coal list. Right. And it, basically the first thing that will actually catch fire with uh, not a ton of effort. Yeah. Some, sometimes That's why they lignite, like it, it ignites, I guess. I, if you ignite is in the word lignite, that's, <laughs> I've actually I've never noticed that until now that the word ignite is <laughs> no I, neither have I um, if you if you, you know, like if you're picturing coal in your head when you think of coal you're picturing black right you're picturing like a black rock or you should because that's what coal is um, lignite often 
has a really brown hue to it. Mm-hmm. It's sometimes called brown coal mm-hmm. because it, you know, it's and and really low grade lignite. You can it's it's almost peaty in texture. Mm-hmm. You can still see like fibrous materials. It's really soft. You can you can oftentimes crumble it up pretty easily. Um, and with lignite, you tend to get a lot of you get like a, a, a fair amount of sulfur deposits yeah. with that as well, right? Yep. The, yeah, with some some of the samples of, of lignite that I've seen, it's yeah, it's just kind of crumbly. It's not like it's it's it doesn't look good. <laughs> no, and <laughs> but it's, there's a lot of yellow in it too. There there can be there can be yellow in there, and that that's that's just sulfur. And yeah, and it has it has a lot of moisture in it, so it it can um, spontaneously combust. And so oh, really? oftentimes, <clears throat> especially in old coal bunkers, like where you know on steamships or, or trains or whatnot, sometimes the the coal bunker would catch fire. And it, it, if if they were using say lignite, it's because the the coal itself combusted spontaneously. Mm. There's some thought yeah. that. The cold, there was a coal bunker fire on the Titanic as it was crossing. No kidding. That they were dealing with. Yep. Oh. Huh. Yeah. How about it, that? Yeah. It, about that? it got put out when the when the ship sank. <laughs> uh, too, too soon. Yeah, sorry. I, my apologies. That was that was in poor taste. Uh all right. So from lignite, which is uh seventy percent carbon ish in that realm lignite yeah Yeah. can get up that's probably the max okay yeah then we have sub bituminous yeah so you keep squishing it you're driving off all the volatiles and you're just concentrating the carbon and so basically as we move along this like this coal spectrum that's what we're going to be seeing we're going to you're going to see that we're going to continue to add pressure this we're going to continue to heat this up drive out those volatiles and just basically get pure and pure carbon i guess not pure more concentrated is what i should have said more concentrated carbon as we as we kind of move along along this um uh, each stop for for coal you know so sub bituminous has a little bit more of a concentra- a little bit higher of a concentration of carbon and then and then as we continue to uh, increase the pressure and cook this stuff, then it goes into bituminous coal. And so I want to say off the top of my head, bituminous coal now is where it starts to, what they say, like, you know, quote, I don't like using this term, but this is just the term that's used. Like kind of like, it's like a cleaner burning coal because it is no. Yeah. It definitely has less volatiles in it. Um, and when we, when we say cook it, we're, we're talking like a hundred to 200 degrees C now for bituminous um, and you're getting anywhere from like high seventies to low 90% carbon. So when you say clean (laughs) or clean ish, it's because, you know, you've driven off, you know, everything except for the last 10 to 20% of your schmutz. That's a technical term. Schmutz. Mm, it's very scientific. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so all this stuff would be considered in the sedimentary rock realm up to bituminous coal. And then all of a sudden, then we get to anthracite coal and anthracite coal is considered a metamorphic rock. It's at, it's been, there's a lot of pressure that has been introduced to form anthracite coal. Uh, it only forms at the borders of mountain belts um, and this is like, we're dealing with like 90 plus percent carbon. We're heating this stuff up to like 200, 300 degrees Celsius. And we're looking at depths of uh, burial or like eight to 10 kilometers underground. So yeah, pretty deep, pretty, pretty, pretty deep. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> anthracite's sort of interesting. You know, you, you need high temperature and high pressure and, I'm always, you know, early on, I was always hesitant to call it a metamorphic rock. <clears throat> but it, I, I guess I'm on board with it now. Does it change properties? I mean, they all, the bituminous technically 
changes properties. So it, one of the things with the anthracite is that our understanding of how it forms is still up for debate. Okay. Where, so there, there's some thought that, you know, when you're, when you're in these mountain belts and one of the reasons you get in the mountain belts is that if you have um, high pressure uh, groundwater that, that's getting injected at depth and it heats up and it's interacting and, and, and basically cooking the material. And that's one of the ways in which it's thought you can form anthracite. So I'm, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm on board with calling it a metamorphic rock now. But I get my, my question, my very simplified definition of metamorphic rock is you lose the, the sort of stratigraphy structure, you know, kind of goes away. Well, you, but you don't. But I guess when I, when I look at bituminous, you know, you can kind of see, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's an it interesting. Just, it, almost looks, it almost looks crystalline. Oh, anthracite? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's as well, opposed yeah. to just so like your sedimentary, yeah. just like. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. You, <clears throat> That's a good way. Yeah, they're both, I would say both bituminous and, and they're, they're diagenetic. They're being altered at depth. Yes. Yes. Um, and yeah, there, there's compression. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not disagreeing that it's it's metamorphic. I'm just. I'm just saying. I was. I was always. I was always like, ah, you know, you you, you find it associated with sedimentary rocks that aren't metamorphosed. That 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 is a good point. And and also I, you know. The, the strict there the, the like intro to geology definition of metamorphic rock is you lose all structure from your yeah. previous realm but they also find fossils in metamorphic rock because they'll be in like bends or twists or something something that wasn't as pressurized or wasn't as yeah cool. it's, it's still metamorphic rock but you still have a fossil well how can you yeah. have a fossil if you lost all your you know yeah so and you you don't find any fossils fossils in anthracite, but you do in the surrounding, in the underclays and, and the, the shales. I guess you do find some slate associated. You do find the slate, which is metamorphic, um, associated with it. Yeah, like the fern fossils and stuff from yeah, or or all the like Bear Valley, like the humpback. Yeah, the whaleback. Whaleback. That's what I'm trying to say. Whaleback. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting <clears throat> it's interesting that it's one of those things where it's it's this topic and you think like oh you know people have been studying coal for two hundred years it's one of the first sort of rocks people looked at with geology because of the economic importance with it and because of the access. Yeah, go back to our Hutton episode. Yeah, yeah, and uh, William William Stratus Smith was also working yeah. in the coal, coal canals, right? Oh yeah, coal mines and the canals. But our understanding of exactly how anthracite forms is still, it's to some extent debated. There's different, people have come up with different explanations. So it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think so, at least. And that's, so, well, so, well, real quick, next on our outline is, how do we do an outline? Well, first, I will say... <laughs> <laughs> Cole keeps the lights on, but how do we keep the lights on at the podcast? Ah, that's a much better segue than my outline one. <laughs> <laughs> talking about the formatting formula, that's what I'm talking about. That's what keeps the lights on at the Jolly <laughs> Flannel Cast. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. I wish I would have done that instead. But anyway, formattingformula.com, check them out. Uh, all of your word formatting documenting needs um also they have your own basically teach yourself videos at youtube which is formatting uh youtube forward slash c forward slash formatting formula um i you know i know i talked about this before but i'm updating a, a document from the early 90s at work and it, it has this like super funky thing where 
in Word now, it, it shows the word is misspelled. So I right click it and then all the font squishes together and it spells it correctly, but it, you can't read it because it's all squished together. And I was like, what, what is going on here? So I emailed the formatting formula. They said, just send me the document. They worked their magic. I don't know how they did it, but they did it and they sent it back to me and it went from like 12 different fonts also to one font and uh, 12 different font points down to one font point. Like anyway, formatting formula, I can't say enough good things about them. I, you know, I know they are a sponsor, but I, I really do <laughs> pretty much <laughs> tap into their knowledge weekly to figure out, <laughs> you know, you think, oh, it's word. You're just typing. How hard could it be? Well, apparently for a dumbo like me, pretty hard. <laughs> so check them out. Formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. Um, but, you know, even more important than learning Word is letting them know that the flannel cast sent you there. <laughs> so first tell them the flannel cast sent you there, then learn all the Word stuff you need to learn. But yeah, check them out. Formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. Tell them geology flannel cast sent you. Good. So that was a great advertisement right there. Yeah. Uh, listen, you know, I do voiceovers in my spare time. You could, you have, you should be on radio. I don't know why you're wasting your time on podcasting. You should be. <laughs> I, I, know. I don't have a face for YouTube. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, uh, anthracite, we're going to call it metamorphic. Yeah. How do we get it out of the ground, though? Yeah, dig it out. Oh, I'm problem just solved. Say it. Done. <laughs> All right. All right. That wraps up the episode. <laughs> yeah, ask a stupid question, you're going to get a stupid answer, right? <laughs> All right. So, one of the things, whenever you're mining for whatever, you know, whatever it is you're mining for, you want to make sure or the, the company wants to make sure that it's economically feasible to take the stuff out of the ground, right? You don't want to make, you, what you don't want to have happen is that you spend more money taking this stuff, extracting the stuff out of the ground than, than what you're going to make on the market, right? So it seems like rule of thumb here, when you're looking for coal seams, they need to be one to three meters in thickness to be economical or to, uh, yeah, to be economical to mine, right? Um, what what is very common? Coal is very common, especially if uh, if you're driving. Uh, I see it all the time driving along the East Coast. Uh, here, uh, a lot of these uh, you, you kind of go up just uh, west of the Appalachians, and you see these tiny little coal seams uh, from these basically from these ancient deltas. That's another, another well, I guess that kind of goes on with the kind of the quote, like yeah, the sure. estuary and environments yeah. that we're, we're talking about. But um, you see lots of these little coal seams and some of them can be like really, really thin, like, uh, I don't know, a couple, couple inches thick, just, you know, not, not, very, not very thick at all. So nobody, nobody wants to mine that, all right? That's not going to make anybody any, any money. And that's, that's the whole reason why these companies are mining this stuff is, is to make money, right? So you need you need to have a you know some substantial thickness to these things to mine, but here's the thing about coal mining, it's uh, it's pretty messy, all right. And this is where a lot of the environmental impacts really start to start to kick in, all right. Um, it can it honestly if if you mine coal incorrectly, I would even argue that there really is no uh, proper way to, to mine coal. There's always going to be some type of environmental impact. When How you're, dare you? When you're dealing with this. All right. Uh, so no, that goes with mining. Anything it has not, has always, nothing to do with coal. Yeah. It has to do with resource any, extraction. Exactly. Yeah. Not just coal. Anytime you dig a hole in the ground to get something out of it, chances are you're messing something else up nearby. <laughs> yeah. So, so. So just because you're not mining coal, don't feel high and mighty. Look exactly. At, look at your computer and your cell phone. Yep. All of the resources in there were extracted somehow. Yeah. And, and this first type of mining, it's funny. When I was a kid, I was taught how great this was. <laughs> really? Like, I, yeah. I oh, 
in, in the eighties. Yeah. So strip mining or mountaintop removal, which is basically this, this is usually economically viable when the coal seam is like less than a hundred meters deep. So a hundred meters, that's huge. It's a football field. So companies it's economically viable for a company to remove a whole football field worth of a mountain <laughs> first to then get to that one to three foot seam of coal and then and then you know get f- follow it along wherever it goes when i was a kid like in my textbooks it would be like you know here's what it looked like before and it was just like a forest with a mountain and now here's what it looks like after and it's like a recreational lake and like picnic well, areas and all this other like nice stuff yeah it's like, oh that's... mountaintop removal is great yeah. yeah so strip mining is 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 a little different from mountaintop removal itself strip mining you don't necessarily have to remove a mountain strip mining is just you're removing layers of earth overburden and it works really well if if your coal seams are horizontal mm-hmm. or, or nearly horizontal. You just remove all the earth above it, and then you can get that that coal. But yeah, it's the same idea. You're just removing all of this overburden. But yeah, a lot of times you know, with mountaintop removal or, or strip mining, you hit the water table, and so then you you fill up these big pits with water. And yeah, I remember seeing sort of these yeah advertisements like we're just creating recreation areas and they're in in parts where they're doing mountaintop removal i want to say in west virginia they're putting a golf course on top of one uh they're like look at this yeah it's gorgeous we took this useless forest turned it into a golf course and golf Um, courses by the way have a they got neck uh an environmental impact (laughs) in them golf courses aren't just uh you know, you, you get you get a lot of um, you know. I guess all the all the 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 chemical treatments that they use for the golf courses and stuff. That's that's not and, uh, and the watering and the mowing. Yeah, and the, yeah, and the, yeah. the gas powered mowers and the uh, yeah. Don't get me started on the golf carts. Yeah, I, I well, some of them are electric. They are powered by solar. <laughs> they have solar powered golf carts, no. or if you have. Uh, I, I no, they do have electric. they do have electric golf carts. Yeah, but, yeah. I yeah, I know about that. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's kind of you know strip mining and, and on top removal is you know it's obviously pretty invasive, if you will. Um, but you know they they to do that they have these huge shovels or, or drag you know they're called drag lines or you can have the old ones were steam buckets, but these things just massive and the dump trucks that, to haul out this material they're, they're just these massive um, dump trucks that are called eucalyptus or, or ukes and <clears throat> so like growing up some of the back roads would take you you know between stripping pits and, and whatnot and you'd always have to watch because they the ukes would would cross the road but the cab is on the is on the on the opposite side and so like if you're on coal roads it, you know there'll be signs that say like drive on drive on the left because you do everything in reverse because the cabin is on the the opposite side and they're like what's the reason for that for having the, uh, the cabin great on the question. Side? no clue but they're because they want to be like the u.s postal postal service I mean, right? it doesn't really matter they're like <laughs> or they're like two stories up in the air they could they wouldn't be able to see if you're driving a little car anyway yeah, uh, they're they're massive, massive machines. Just they're they're so big. How big are they? That in in stripping, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that the the shovel is digging down or moving this overburden. That when they when they're when they remove all of the coal and it you know and the geology tells them there's no more you know reason at a reasonable depth coal to get to the the they'll just stop using that stripping pit right but it's it's more economically feasible for them just to leave the the shovel in the pit yeah yeah and so like you you know growing up you you could walk around the woods and these old stripping pits just have these huge shovels still in them and sometimes they would fill in with water and you just see the boom sticking out of the water 
Mm -hmm. a really good place to climb up and dive off of but uh nice well that's what what is that children's book children's book we talked there's a children's book about the steam shovel and 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 he dug so fast and he dug so are you talking about john henry it was a steel driving man no shoot this is gonna kill me anyway carry on <laughs> no, it's a I steam he's shovel. Look that, it up that, right now, I, I vaguely he, but, remember what you're but talking he, about. He but. went out of work because nobody wanted the steam shovel anymore, and then he found this small town that needed a the new courthouse built or something, and he and he dug the courthouse faster. But he dug so oh, fast, yeah. and he dug so Mike, well. Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. Yes, Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. Look at you. This looks crazy. Because it was steam shovels I, were going out of yeah. favor, and then he yeah. dug so fast, so he ended up at the bottom of the thing, and they're like, well, nobody wants steam shovels anyway. Why don't we just make him the boiler? So he became the heating unit for that building. Ah, I, you know, now that I'm look, I looked this up. Uh, this is an old book. That, um, this book's over 75 years old. I read it to my kids many times. I can't believe I can't remember. I rem- the name. I remember that I was looking at the the artwork in this book. I remember this from like kindergarten, like being like a real tiny little kid reading this. Yeah, Mike, how about that? Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel, based on a true story. Right? Yeah, I remember the 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 uh, the author would give readings and when I was a kid. I'm just kidding. I'm Wait, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right so yeah these i guess so these shovels are huge um and uh you know some are uh have here some are larger than a two-car garage in one scoop yeah i've seen some of those like modern models or engineering shows or things like that where where they show like the world's largest ones Mm -hmm. and they're like gigantic it's ridiculous it's it's something like a hundred SUVs in in one scoop or something. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I the engineering behind that stuff is is just bananas. It's a, it's a, it's amazing how they you know come up with that kind of stuff. Yeah, and and some of these shovels now they're like electric, and like you you need to tap into like the gigantic electric grid wires, like you know. It's so like you basically sh- need like a nuclear power plant just to Ex- keep this thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Wow, how about that? Um, all right, so that's, you know, um, so there's kind of, so we, were, we talked about strip mining and mountaintop removal. So, you know, this, some of the stuff you, you see, you know, like Steve, Steve was mentioning as a little kid, you kind of saw these before and after pictures, but he, it's, you know, it's, it's all about how it's, it's portrayed. He saw some stuff that looked, you know, like, Oh, it looks like a, like a, like a golf resort or whatever, like a, like a fun, fun recreational Lake. But you know, some of this other stuff you see, like, uh, like out in West Virginia, they do this a lot and it's just, they literally just remove the whole mountain or a huge chunk of it just to get to, to that coal seam. So it's uh you know, you're moving around a lot of earth to to get through to get to um, these these coal deposits. That is a good question. What do they do with the top of the mountain? You know, I was just wondering that. I, I, that's a <clears throat> lot. That's a lot of earth. To well, I know. I, I know. Like in, in strip mines, they they just pile it up elsewhere, and you get these huge coal piles. And so those aren't considered tailings, right? Tailings are. Is it, you would you could cons- yeah you would consider them tailings it, yeah. it, it it's the overburden and whatnot mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah tailings oftentimes is when you're breaking it up to get the coal out but you, yeah you just have these huge essentially man-made mountains next to it I, I know that there's a bunch in Pennsylvania um, and they, they present a whole host of problems that we can talk about next episode yeah health health and safety and environmental problems yeah um to talk about uh aberfan which is a a disaster in wales that happened with with uh one of these piles yeah Um, that was in the crown was we were talking about the crown a little bit before we started (laughs) podcasting so full circle um yeah it's interesting i mean so 
strip mining and mountaintop removal, the, the reason they're mainly employed today is because they're efficient. It's just easier. It's, it's, we have the technology or the, the power just to remove all of it to get to the, to the coal. Whereas old school methods would be underground mining. Well, so is the, the strip mining, is that more also like there's the element of danger of the, the mines collapsing that's also gone to? Yeah. I guess they take that into consideration as well. Yeah, I guess that's that's a good point. There's a safety. Yeah, it's yeah, it's for health and safety. Yeah. Marginally safer. So, um, but there's you know, you can also have the underground mining where like the old school stuff where you you're you're you know carving out mine shafts and you know, and gotta it's take, gotta take the elevator all the way down and well, it's, it's hot down there. Yeah, it's and it's still <clears throat> It, well, it depends on how deep you go, but it, underground mining is still, it's probably half of all coal mining is still underground. There's, it's a big percentage is still, maybe not half, but, you know, in, in, in a lot of parts of West Virginia and Kentucky, you're still doing deep mining. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you were saying you take the elevator. So if you're taking the elevator down, that's called a shaft mine. If you're just going vertically <clears throat> versus if you're going in at an angle, that's called slope mining. You go in at an angle to, to you hit the seam of coal, and then you you're you're mining the coal out. Or drift mining is where you you go on the mountain and you know where the coal is, if, especially if the coal is nearly horizontal, and then you just dig into the mountain horizontally. That would be drift mining. Um, and you know, there's different ways when you're underground mining. You you can either D dig out the coal and you, you sort of leave behind pillars of coal that act as supports. Mm -hmm. They have um, they, they have machines now. They're, I think they're called long wall miners that are, and sometimes you'll see, if, especially if you, if you see like West Virginia or Kentucky or Southwestern Pennsylvania miners um, <clears throat> where they're just attacking the seam of coal. So, you know, you might be somewhere that's, uh, three feet high and they have these really narrow mach motorized machines that go and they just carve up the the coal and, and sort of spit it back on a conveyor belt and as they move the machine itself is bracing the ceiling oh how about that <clears throat> um yeah it's it's interesting there, there's a whole there's a whole number of ways you can and old school mines they would they would put timber as a brace, they wouldn't use pillar pillars. They would um, put timbers up to support the, the ceiling itself. And um, so like bootleg miners back in the day would go into a mine when, when no one was in there and they would pull the timbers, it's called robbing timbers, and it would cause the ceiling of the mine to collapse. And then they would go in and and pick through that material and get coal out and it was like a quick and easy way to sort of get coal oh man that's risky the work of the mine yeah oh <laughs> <laughs> sounds crazy yeah, yeah. Like, i had a i had a great uncle who was a bootleg miner and and so the story was told to me by my grandfather but he was doing that <clears throat> and the yeah the problem is that if the roof collapses you know, you sort of destabilize the area. And here there was uh, another shaft, you know, right next to where he was. And it, when it collapsed in, it, it busts through this abandoned shaft that had flooded with water. And so all the water rushed in and flooded the, the oh, mine. And he was stuck like waist deep in, in water for like two days before he found his way out. Oh, Anyway, he wow. and, and that's groundwater. That's like cold yeah. water. He gave up bootlegging mining after that. I would hope so. <laughs> uh, yeah. So deep well, mining is, boy, that's scary. Yeah, don't do that. If you're listening yeah. to the podcast, don't don't do there, that. There was just a mine collapse in China the other day. 20, 20 miners got trapped. Oh, jeez. Mm. You yeah. know, and and these miners that get trapped. Um, you're down there in the it's pitch black you can't see the hand in front of your face uh, i don't know if you've ever been on a if you ever been on a cave tour usually they'll you know you get 
deep down into the cave and, and uh, you know, the, 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 your tour guide will shut off the lights and, you know, they'll shut off the lights for, I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute or whatever. And it's like, it's creepy. It's, you know, it's, it's a new it, level of darkness. Yeah. And then what is it? After a while, you start to hallucinate. Yeah, there's a name for that where you start seeing like, uh, <clears throat> and the, they found there's like this, uh, there's a condition where if, if they found it with trapped miners where they start seeing the same things and it's like, this, oh, that's creepy. Yeah, there's like a, there's a psychological or there's a technique. Yeah, it's called ghosts. They're yeah. seeing ghosts. So <clears throat> it, ghosts in a mine that, you know, you hear noises like pounding or what they're called Tommy knockers. <laughs> uh, isn't that a Stephen King book? It is. It is. Um, so one of the, and this actually, one of the, th- in deep mines, especially or if you're underground mining, one of the issues they run into um, is that when you get above bituminous and, and in the subbituminous bituminous into anthracite, the, the coal starts to, uh, what's called, you get demethanization, demethanization, basically methane starts being produced. Mm-hmm. It's a volatile that comes out and it's just natural. It's methane is natural gas. And um, <clears throat> the, you get different types of gases that are produced fr- from this material. And they're in the, in mining, they're referred to as damps, which comes from the German dumped, which means the vapors. So you get the vapors. <laughs> oh, I catch the vapors. <laughs> but they have, they have sort of different names. But the, the big the big one the scary one is is uh, methane and methane is sometimes called fire damp or coal damp, um, <clears throat> but it it's you know you get this methane that builds up and it's obviously very explosive, and so it just starts accumulating in these pockets underground and that's that's one of the sort of the problem with, with underground mining it's one of the the reasons you you get miners trapped is you know these combustibles uh my favorite of the damps however <clears throat> is uh hydrogen sulfide which you know rotten egg smell is called stink damp hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was my nickname in high school <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah i guess uh while we're on the topic of this isn't in the outline i'm totally improving right now but well, i like i'm excited yes while we're on the topic we have to talk about the term canary in a coal mine ah, yeah. ah. so um where they comes from uh they were uh the miners used to bring in canaries in these little cages and uh they'd carry them down to the tunnels and what you don't want having happen is a buildup of, of gases like like carbon monoxide in these in these tunnels so it'll kill you right and it's a you know stuff like that it's it's a silent killer so what happened was the gases would kill the canary before the miners and so they see the canary the canary dies and they say oh we gotta get out of here you know it's no bueno not enough oxygen you know so that's uh yeah. That's where that comes from. And they actually started to even industrialize the canary in the coal mine. Like they would put in ventilation shafts and they would have canaries, like several canaries in cages in the ventilation shaft. And if canaries started dying from the ventilation that was coming out of the shaft, then they would know that something was wrong <laughs> and so it wasn't just like one miner bringing down a caged canary like at some point they actually started bringing in lots of canaries into the vent to make sure that the ventilation the air that was coming out wasn't killing people so i just sent you guys a link you should check this out right now there is a picture on this uh i'm just on the the wikipedia page for canary in a coal mine and they have a picture of this canary cage, right? And so what the caption for this picture, this is pretty amazing. It says a canary cage used in mines. And on the top, there's a little oxygen cylinder. And it said, uh, the handle is an oxygen cylinder that can be used to revive the canary 
for reuse. <laughs> like, why for reuse? <laughs> uh, hey, man, I'm sure. I'm sure. It, like, you know, in the late 1800s, canaries became probably uh, hot commodities. It's just, not to not to revive the canary. Yeah, I was no. thinking, like, oh, that's really <laughs> nice. That's so sweet that they're doing. Yeah, it. They're, yeah. they're no, bringing the canary they're, back. So they're reuse. bringing that canary slowly, close to death, and then let's do it again, and let's yeah. do it again. Are you kidding me? That's like canary hell. <laughs> yeah i know so Go often, towards the light <laughs> yeah. so a lot of times the canaries they would keep them in cages near the 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 uh, uh the mule stables so this is something you don't maybe think about but mules were the main source of of energy to pull the the mine carts up until about the 1930s like much longer than you probably maybe realize and um so they the mules lived their whole lives in the mine and they never went out, like they never saw daylight is that what you're saying they, yeah they would they would maybe depending on on the mule but yeah they because they were sort of short and they were stout and they they actually didn't mind the darkness what whereas like horses you know, mules, you think of it as being pretty temperamental, and they are, if you've ever dealt with a mule. But uh, apparently, they were suited for coal mines, mm. their temperaments. How about that? So, yeah, so you go down and, you know, the stables usually, when you got to the, if you was a slope mine or something, you get to the, the main ve uh, ventilation doors. So there'd be different there'd be sets of doors because you really have to control how air flows to make sure it's, it's ventilated. And, and people recognize that pretty early on. And so when you got to the first set of, of doors, usually your, your stables were, <clears throat> were, were close to that. But you go in and you have these stables and you would have canaries there. You just have all these bird cages. Wow. Just, well, just a menagerie before you, you know. So I guess the mules were more valuable than the people? I mean, I don't want to say yes or no, but but it sounds like it. <laughs> Here's a good picture I just sent you all of. So, uh, fun fact about coal mines: um, Do you guys, any of you guys, know when and where the first coal mine in North America kicked off? No, but this just made me realize I forgot to talk about the story about. Anthracite coal being discovered, but yeah, go on. All right. So uh, the first coal mine in North America began in New Brunswick, Canada in the early 1600s. Whoa. Good day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah put another shrimp on the barbie. That's, isn't that Australia? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Austria. Ge geography flannel cast here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. What's your story about anthracite? What do you want to say? What did I want to say? <laughs> well, so anthracite was was discovered. I think I've told this story. I don't know if it was on the podcast or on a Patreon episode. But there was a like this hunter trapper who was um, hunting and or trapping as you do <laughs> uh, near near where I grew up in, in in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And so the the legend. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but his name was Nico Allen. And he, he fell asleep basically on, on the broad mountain and he woke up and, and the mountain was on fire because the campfire that he had made before he went to bed w was on like an outcropper on a seam of coal. Oh. Like, so an well, anthrac and maybe we'll save this for the next episode. Yeah. About uh, the, the fires. Yeah. Well, and, and it's use sort of in the industrial revolution and yeah. And, and whatnot so that was in the in the late 1700s hmm. oh that that late or that early i guess i should say yeah 1790 ish that's awesome yeah it's a good story <laughs> um yeah yeah so i, I you know <laughs> how much one thing, one thing we i think we forgot to mention is is the compressibility Yes. So you were saying about how economically viable seams of coal. And it reminded me of, of this story about they were building 
<clears throat> some sort of office building or uh, like a store or something in, in the north of where I grew up and they were building it into the side of a hill. And as they were excavating it to build this little office building, they hit a seam of coal and it stopped all construction because it, there was enough there that they're like, well, we're gonna remove all this coal first before we finish building. Let's get some extra money about out of this. But, <laughs> but when you find these seams that are, you know, two feet, three feet, four feet thick, that represents, if it's anthracite, you know, maybe a, so the, I always learned that the compressibility, the ratio was a hundred to one. So one foot of anthracite coal represents a hundred feet of plant material. Holy uh -huh. cow. Yeah. And the, the, the big vein, the big seam or the big vein that runs through northeastern Pennsylvania is the mammoth vein that in places is 40, 50, 60 feet thick. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So uh, you're talking, so do they have an age estimate of how long it took that to deposit that? Uh, not that I know off the top of my head. That's a great But point. it's got to be like over a million years. Yeah. I, you know, basically a million years of being a swamp. That's an interesting, yeah, question. Interesting yeah. question. Well, well, that's why I'm here. Not for answers, <laughs> just to pose questions. So, um, but yeah, that, that is crazy that, that it takes that much stuff mm -hmm. to get compressed and squished and, you know, basically dewatered and everything is taken out of it, essentially, except for the organic material. Crazy. Got another little fun fact for you guys right now, because yeah. why not? Uh, the looks like the first evidence of uh, coal mining goes back to 3490 BC in China. Ooh, hmm. it's like 5,000 years of coal mining. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a lot earlier than I thought. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Lots of so the you know coal mining goes way, way, way back in you know, human history that's that's awesome yeah so uh i guess what we could do right now um we could talk about uh current u.s energy consumption and how coal relates to that yeah i think that'd be a good way to wrap it up and then <clears throat> we can save a few of these tidbits for our next episode yeah yeah so Okay, let's see. Right now, in the United States, as of 2019, um, coal. Chris, uh, it's, at, it's 2021. It's 2021. <laughs> Come but on, the numbers, man. but the numbers from 2020 are not in yet. All right. All right. 2020 just ended like I'll the other week. I'll give you a break. All right. Um, so it looks like as of 2019, coal was about coal made up. 11% uh, of U.S. energy consumption. Um, yeah. And so then in the, if you break it down, so most of, most of the use of coal goes towards electricity. Yes. Right? Like 90% uh, of 90 percent, that. Yes. Yeah. Goes to electricity generation, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize that when you generate electricity, like half of that is lost. It just never, like, it, it's never used? No, no, no. It's just, like, lost through, like... Inefficiencies. Heat or inefficiencies or just the transfer of, you know, transmission lines. Like, so so of that 11% that's gone to electricity, only, like, 5% of it actually makes it to your outlet. Yeah, there's... Um, yeah, you know, it's just... So, it's, I, I just... I. I, I just never, amazing. I, how, I was how never much, aware of that either. Yeah. How much yeah. is just, yeah. Inefficient. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And then also of all the sources in, in the United States, this is also just for 2019. Like I said, the numbers for 2020 aren't out yet. 2020 <laughs> descended 13 days ago as of this recording. <laughs> I'll cut you I break. I need those Ca numbers now. <laughs> Carry on, buddy. Carry on. So as of uh, 2019, 
of uh, of all the sources of electricity in the United States, coal was uh, coal made up twenty three percent of of the electricity. Or I, I guess uh, yeah, twenty three. How can I phrase that? Uh, it's twenty. 23% of all the electricity that was uh, produced in the United States came from coal, all right? So we got uh, natural gas was actually 38%. Looks like coal was 23%. Nuclear power was 20. Petroleum was 1%. And then your renewables were 17%. Yeah, and that's 2020. You'll see renewables. I, I, I was looking at it. I, I want to say renewables are like 22 now. They're, they're like number two. They've overtaken, I want to say, coal and nuclear. I, I heard I that number jumped up to 22 once Steve got his solar panels on his house. Yeah. Right? Wow, that's that true. Personal. Listen, and I, <laughs> and I know if you, uh, there haven't been new nuclear permits issued in a long time. In Georgia, they're, they're working on a, a, a giant nuclear power plant. They've been working on that for 30 years. Yeah. And it's just a little bit over budget right now. Uh, <laughs> just there, a pinch. And there are a couple of plants that went offline. And so. And I may or may not be paying an extra tax just for that uh, nuclear power plant to be built right now. But listen, it, it is a stable method of energy. It's just. It is, yeah. Um, it, it may have lost some popularity after HBO's Chernobyl came out. <laughs> I mean, we could do a whole other episode on nuclear energy. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. About one, of the, one of the interesting, I think, things, in, and maybe we'll talk about this next time, is is also like just 10 years, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, somewhere in that range. Coal accounted for like 40% of electricity yeah. generation. It was, it was, it was the, the, the main source. Yeah. And, and if you remember even uh, six, eight years ago, there was a big push, I guess more than eight years ago, but there was a big push for nuclear energy um and is this pre fukushima exactly right. <laughs> just pre right before fukushima daiichi uh, again so um again as just a, a stable uh non uh, once it's built non carbon producing energy Basically, platform i mean every you know every Anything that we use for energy is going to have its pros and cons. Yes. Right. There's 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 no free ride. There's no free nope. lunch, as they as they would say. Even things like you know something you might think is like you know super clean like solar, you know we still have to get the the um the the parts for the solar panels. You know we yeah. still we still need to extract resources to create solar panels. So there is no there's there's no such thing as a free lunch when it comes to energy production. Nope. And speaking of ener energy production, where where in the United States does most of our coal come from? Uh, it comes from Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah, most of it comes from Wyoming. 40%. Which is interesting because coming from Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia makes up 11% and Pennsylvania takes up 6%. I really thought Pennsylvania. Well, I mean, yeah. that's these are 2020 numbers. If you, if you were talking... You know, 1880 like, numbers. Yeah, 1880. We'd be crushing it. <laughs> We're number one. Uh, <laughs> but there's, that's there's an interesting story when it comes to environmental remediation about Wyoming versus the East Coast, West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Kentucky, which we'll talk about next episode. Oh, now now you got me on the edge of my seat. Yeah. I wish we were doing the next episode right now, but <laughs> I guess I'll just have to tune into the next one. This, the, yeah, this next episode, oh, like we said, we really need to just devote a whole episode kind of to the environmental stuff associated, or the environmental impacts associated with this, uh, with with coal mining and, and the use of the use of uh, coal. Um, it's, it, there's a lot, there's, there's yeah. a lot going on. There's it really is. There's a lot of stories about just like crazy stuff uh, that, <laughs> that happens when you when you mine coal and just kind of some of the some of the direct effects and some of the indirect effects mm -hmm. as well that are associated with just using coal. 
All right. So we real have quick. Town, entire towns have been just totally abandoned and destroyed. Uh, uh, well, all right. All right. All That's right, enough right. of a teaser. All right. <laughs> all right let, let's wrap it up. So, so production, most of it comes from Wyoming. Uh, a little bit comes from West Virginia. A little bit comes from Pennsylvania. A little bit comes from others. And, and this is another stat that blew my mind was that 45% of all coal production is bituminous, which, okay, that I kind of got, I thought it would have been a little bit higher. I didn't realize that 40, the other 45, another 45% is sub bituminous. Yep. Dirty. So essentially like either not quite bituminous or lignite, like dirty coal. And then, uh-huh. or, you know, 10% is lignite. And then anthracite is only negligible. Yeah. Is it really not that much anthracite in the world? Uh, no, no, this isn't the world. These numbers are the United States and okay. these 2019 numbers in the U S but the, the majority of anthracite globally is in Pennsylvania. Right, right. Or I guess maybe our partner over in England. It's, well, n- no, it's it's Pennsylvania. Is it? Uh, I wasn't sure just based on the Appalachian. Yeah, no, it's they don't have much okay. in the way of anthracite. And, and part of that is <clears throat> anthracite, it burns a lot hotter and it burns, you know, quote, cleaner. But it, Get it's more tough. bang for your buck with the answer. It, it's tough to ignite, and so it's it's not used a lot, say in electricity generation. It's just easier to use bituminous. Got it's it. harder to mine and extract anthracite. So anthracite's a lot of times it was used. <clears throat> it was it was used in uh, heating homes. It was a good because it 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 burns so hot that it it, it was good for boilers and things like that. Um, so that's sort of one of its main uses was was boilers and it, it's used a lot in um in uh, steel production like that, yeah that's specialty steel so you would coke it and then mm-hmm. make it specialty steel but one of the things they use it for um currently is is filtration systems sort of interesting oh and like for, activated like, carbon yeah, they're using it in, in some of these higher tech filter systems. Huh. How about that? Wow. Yeah. Interesting. It's also used in uh, specialty pizza ovens. <laughs> uh, that's, I, that's random. That's <laughs> No, I, I have seen that. Like, I've seen ads for that. I'm like, coal fired pizza. I'm like, I, 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 how are these people not worried about getting sued? Like, it's got to be. It's delicious. it's delicious. Stop it. Have you eaten it? Yeah, of course I've had coal-fired pizza. Mister, I haven't left my basement in a year eats coal-fired pizza. Oh, no, I haven't had it in, in over a year. No, I understand <laughs> that, but you'll eat coal-fired pizza. Yeah, it's just <sighs> an oven. I mean, you're just burning it in the oven. I mean, I, I guess, you know, but you're not worried about, like, I, I guess I guess if it's anthracite, I guess it's just as, probably just as clean as natural gas. And you know what? You just said Jesse hasn't left his basement in over a year, all right? It's I just did them. It's eleven months. He hasn't left his basement, all right. <laughs> Give me some, cut me some slack. Come on, here. come on. Give the guy uh, a but break. You, you right? have to, you have to count the early twenty twenty, just natural winter hibernation period for Thornberry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my sleepy time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that just about wraps it up for our first. The first episode on our little, yeah. little can mini we, series. On can call. we can we quickly mention my new sweet shirt? That's a that's a sweet shirt. That's Where did you get shirt. that shirt from? Oh, from the geologyflannelcast.com website. Hey, were you able? It looks like you were able to customize that T-shirt a little bit. I did. I, I it's funny. I ordered it right after Christmas, right before New Year's. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get a green T-shirt with the red flannel. It's going to be a sweet holiday t-shirt that I can wear every year. I heard you're going to mod it to have like the, the flashing Christmas lights on it too. I, I might possibly, it depends. Mm-hmm. It depends, <laughs> on, it depends on how fat I get between now, now <laughs> and next Christmas. So I, I'm already, uh, you know, I, I, I ordered it and it fits great, but now I'm already worried with the amount of beer that I'm drinking in 2020 that, 2021 is not going to be any different and i'm going to get another 20 pounds so 
But other than that, yeah, that and drinking my coffee out of my new Geology Flannel Gas coffee mug. <laughs> you know, I'd show you my stickers, but they're on the back of my car right now. I'm telling you, any anything I need, hoodies. So, yeah, yeah. So get long, like we got uh, the like the long sleeve tees, short sleeve tees, hoodies. Uh, go to uh, geologyflannelcast.com, click on merch, and check out all this fun stuff that we got. Um, that yeah, we, for you, for you know, old so, people, merch means merchandise. It's not. It's just you. You're the. You know, everybody knows that. Okay. It's, it was you it's that, not true. I, I, There's I some know. old people who don't know what merch means. Okay. Well, for Steve, merch means merchandise. <laughs> but um, you know, so if you'd yeah. like to help out the geology flannel cast a little bit, um, you get some cool, some cool flannel cast gear out of it. Helps us out a little bit. Helps us, um, you know, some of the upgrades and stuff we're we're planning on with this podcast. But um, also, if you'd like to another way to help out the podcast is to become a patreon member a patreon sponsor we have several tiers uh st- starting at just two dollars a month less than a cup of coffee i got starbucks today and look at you allegedly i got uh, uh potentially a, a coffee from a seattle-based large coffee company i and actually i treated myself. more than two dollars you treat I treated yourself my, i treated myself to uh, a cup of duncan this morning Oh, yeah. a Boston, formerly Boston based. Yeah, it's fun. Megan, Megan left early for work today. Normally we brew a cup, pot of coffee and I got lazy and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to have a Diet Coke. <laughs> wow. She's going to cut to the chase here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. the point I was trying to make is $2 not, a month not is much. Less, it's less than the cup of coffee. It's less than what I paid this morning for my Seattle based large coffee company coffee yeah and if you want to do that every day you know if you want to give us 60 bucks a month we're okay with that too but you can <laughs> yeah, just replace $2. your and seattle-based coffee with a patreon so we got uh with the diff- <laughs> I love that Chris, right now. Chris just dismisses me all the time. <laughs> Shut up, Steve. You're an idiot. <laughs> Steve, I have to, every week I have to deal with this. Uh, <laughs> so we have different tiers. Uh, you can we have uh, Patreon friends listening to the uh, the live recording of the podcast right now, um, mm-hmm. chiming in. Um, we uh, we hang out before the. We have a little Zoom hangout before yeah. the podcast starts, after the, the podcast ends. The chats are coming in. They all say I'm hilarious, Chris. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what <laughs> chats you're looking at. Yeah. The chats I'm seeing, people are saying they're going to gouge their eyeballs out in about 30 <laughs> seconds. So. Uh, yeah. uh, the chats are coming in right now. Just they, they are. Dot, and dot, the, dot. They're, <laughs> they're not in my favor. <laughs> so anyways, you can have all this fun with us with the on uh uh with our patreon friends uh yeah so uh if you have uh, every once in a while we'll do a um a, a listener questions episode so if you have any geology questions uh send them our way um you know once we once we get up um every once in a while we'll, we'll just have a whole episode where you uh we answer questions and so you can submit those on geologyflannelcast.com and um yeah, geologyflannelcast.com is a pretty cool place. You should probably just just check it out. Uh, um, make it make it your homepage. Make it your homepage. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. So also uh, check us out on YouTube. Um, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. We put up all the videos, the podcasts up there. Uh, we're on Twitter at geoflannelcast, and then we're on Facebook, uh, Geology Flannelcast on Facebook. And that is all of the social media stuff. So with that being said, uh, thanks. And oh, thanks, Maddie. Also the Instagram. How many posts we got on the Instagram, Steve? I think Steve's uh, up to two now. We we're up two, to two. two one, one six years ago, one this year. So if you'd like to watch a train wreck uh, mm-hmm. Instagram page, you can check us out on Geology Final Cast. Geology <laughs> Final Cast on our Instagram? I don't even know. Uh... I'm going to leave it up to Maddie, our Instagram <laughs> follower, our, our one Instagram follower. 
All right. But yes. So the, the, uh, we're, the we're getting there. All right. Work. All right, you kids. Geeks I'm getting ge- there. That, thank you, Maddie. Thank Geology you Flannel Ge- Class. Geology Flannel Cast on Instagram. Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bad Instagram page. So. We're, We're getting there. On it. We're, We're working on it. Come on. You can say that, but if you're not doing anything, nobody's working on We're it. In, right? We're in the storyboarding brainstorming. Yes. Okay. We well, really want to put no, together was, a full product. I was not aware of any of the storyboarding. So oh, <laughs> thank you for listening. Listen, to you'd the- already do too much, Chris. We, we, you know, we try to help you out <laughs> the best we can. <laughs> you're right and my stomach ulcer can prove that right <laughs> all right everyone thanks so much for listening we love you guys and we'll see you guys with part two of the call episode next week so stay tuned for that uh and take care be safe out there bye bye Goodbye.